Welcome to the Outdoor Biz Podcast, your home for inspiring conversations with outdoor insiders. Each week, author, speaker, adventurer, and outdoor industry veteran Rick Sayers talks in depth with iconic brand founders, sales and marketing pros, product designers, and industry rising stars. Listen in when Rick's guests offer actionable advice to land your ideal industry gig and grow your outdoor career. Catch us again when the conversation shifts to the hottest outdoor products, destinations, and the latest industry insights. And now, here's Rick. Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Outdoor Biz Podcast. I'm thrilled to talk with fellow podcaster Emily Holland on the show today. Emily has been producing, hosting, and editing shows for over three years, including the Stokecast and the Nature Untold podcast. After recently stepping back from hosting for a bit, now she helps other podcasters get started or supercharge what they've already built. Welcome to the show, Emily. Thanks for having me, Rick. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Other than the cold and the wind, it's great. The sun's out here, so I guess we're doing better than a lot of places. (laughs) That is better than a lot of places. Yeah, it is, I think, five degrees in Boulder, Colorado, although somehow it's also sunny out. I don't don't really know how (laughs) that all works. (laughs) Yeah, we get that. Yeah, we get that sometimes, but we'll take the sun. Absolutely. I grew up in the Northeast and and spent a lot of my early 20s there. And I'm happy with the winter here much better than (laughs) than the winter out there. (laughs) Yeah, I can relate to that. I never, I spent time in the East, but never grew up there. I'm a California boy. So I don't know what winter is really. Yeah, better for it, probably. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. You never know. Maybe I'm not as tough as the Easterners, but whatever. Grew up in the East. Tell us about your first experiences in the outdoors. What was that like? Yeah, I grew up in upstate New York at the foothills of the Adirondack Mountains, where which are basically like like the rest of Appalachia, really nice rolling hills. And I grew up on a Christmas tree farm mm. with my family and my two sisters. And my first experiences in the outdoors were really k- taking care of the farm. And also, we didn't have a ton of resources. And so my mom was really, she was always bringing us outside to go on nature walks and point out different types of plants and animals and that kind of stuff. I feel like my first real nature experiences were on that 10 acre farm in upstate New York. That must have been (laughs) beautiful. Yeah, it's a really lovely piece of the country that I feel doesn't get a lot of a lot of uh, re- good report. Mm-hmm, <laughs> People mm-hmm. are just like, "Oh, New York? You mean the city?" And I'm like, "No, there's more there. I yeah. promise you." Yeah, and then we did a lot of kayaking, canoeing, camping, hiking, and fishing stuff like that in the Adirondacks. So both of those two areas were my my first experiences in the outdoors. Man, that sounds spectacular. Was there one trip or activity that kind of cemented your love or commitment to an outdoor lifestyle? I guess you were living an outdoor lifestyle, though, on the farm, right? That was probably pretty outdoorsy. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I think the one that really comes to mind is we used to camp at this pretty, pretty northern campsite called Ron's Pond every year with my dad's side of the family. And we would get like a block of campsites all on this beautiful like beach on this tiny lake. And we would do essentially like a big kayak and canoe loop every year during that week that we were up there. And I feel like I I don't do as much like boating sports now. I have a stand-up paddleboard, but I, I don't mm-hmm. do a lot of that anymore. But I remember that being so exciting because mm-hmm. you would just have to lift your boat and go across land and then you just are in an entirely different environment and right. then you do it again and you go through it. And it was just something that I I don't think I was like, oh, I really want to be a boater all the time. Mm-hmm. But I think I was like, oh, this is awesome. Like we're outside, we're on the water, we're like working together as a team. I think those experiences up at Rollins Pond were really, really cemented a love of the outdoors in me. And then of course I was an angsty teenager like everyone and was like, hell no, I don't want to do anything that isn't quote unquote cool. So I went away from the outdoors for a little while, lived in Brooklyn for a bit, trying to be a city person. Wow. And <laughs> it didn't work out as you <laughs> can probably tell. So then I came back to the outdoors in my uh, early 20s. Interesting. So we'll get to the city thing in a minute here, but was has there been an epic outdoor adventure or one of those oh shit moments that Scare the crap out of you there with the, with the canoes and that because that can get it's, it's legs and stuff. It's not that bad, but 
No, not with the canoes. I, I certainly get scared rock climbing a lot of the time. So no, that's, that's easy to do. Definitely some, <laughs> yeah, some oh shit moments there and sometimes skiing. But I think the moment that like more recently really made me feel like, okay, I'm living the lifestyle I want to live is when we, myself and my partner went up Wyoming to go do the Cirque of the Towers backpacking route. And in the Wind River Range, it's beautiful up there. There is some rock climbing in there, but we were just there to backpack. And I remember cresting over one of the passes that you go over during that backpacking trip. And I just broke down and cried because we we came over to this pass <laughs> and it was just this huge as the name suggests, Cirque, of these huge rock spires and mm. then a, a beautiful lake and all these little streams going down to the lake. And it was like Neverland or yeah, something spectacular. like that. And so I think more recently, that sort of said to me, like, you made the right move in moving out to the Rockies and this is what you want in your life. And that just cemented that for me. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, Brooklyn, though, you were right in the heart of the city. And that is full on city. Yeah. Yeah. I remember there was, I don't know what I was doing, Rick. I gotta be honest, but <laughs> hey, you know what? We, we're all making stuff up. Even as we go along, <laughs> I'm over 60 now. I'm still making stuff up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I lived in Brooklyn and while it was fun and I still have these sort of rose colored glasses about my time in New York, it was very short lived. I, I really realized it wasn't for me pretty quickly mm -hmm. within a year. Um, and so there was a moment I was like looking outside of my window in Brooklyn, in Bushwick is where I lived. Mm. And because of the amount of pollution that is over <laughs> the city, it, yeah. it basically like trapped in all of the light from the street lamps and the buildings and everything. So there was this like dystopian orange glow outside when mm -hmm. it was like midnight out my window. Mm. And I think like watching that happen outside my window, I was like, I can't live here anymore. I can't do this. This yeah. is not what I want. <laughs> and so I quickly moved. I moved to Boston, but it's a more accessible city and it's closer to some, you can get to the White Mountains from there. You can get to the Green Mountains. You can mm -hmm. get to Maine and the coast. And there's a lot of availability of great outdoor activity, or at least it seemed that way. So that's why I moved up to, to Boston. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Some of those cities, I grew up in a city east of LA and the smog would just blow in every afternoon and your lungs would hurt when you get home from school from playing and breathing that crap. And it just, it's incredible yeah. how, what we put ourselves through. But once you get outside of that and in the mountains, it's just, it's unbelievable. So I don't blame you. Good move. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you said you've launched your podcast, the Nature Untold podcast to explore the intersection between addiction recovery and the outdoors through interviews with folks across the adventure mm -hmm. community. Talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, I started the Nature Untold podcast. The first episode came out in the beginning of 2021. And um, really, I had stopped drinking in February of 2020. And I had found that while there are great stories of addiction and recovery and sobriety within the outdoor community here and there, mm -hmm. there wasn't a dedicated place for mm -hmm. those stories to be told. And in addition to that, I wanted to hear more than just what I saw as like the traditional recovery journey, which is someone ends up in a jail cell and then they go to a recovery program and then they are cured or quote unquote, right? There's this traditional media mm -hmm. narrative and there's just so many more types of stories than that. And that is a valid story as well. But I just wanted to have a place that people in the outdoor community could share their stories, no matter what it was with, if it was alcohol or drugs or love addiction or mm -hmm. codependency or whatever. And it was a way to show also like how the outdoors either aids in that recovery, sometimes doesn't aid in the right. recovery, it harder, right? how yeah. it plays in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So it's been great. And most recently, I'm actually a friend of mine who was on the first season. His name is John Hold. He's going to be running the interviews uh, moving forward for a bit here. So oh, cool. I'm excited about that and, and bringing in you know more new people. And, and he has a different network that is will be opened up to. So mm -hmm. very cool. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. What, what inspired you to create a podcast versus one of the other many creative avenues? How, how did you stumble on the podcasting thing? Yeah, I had always loved like audio mediums. I'm a big NPR person. And, mm -hmm. and in fact, I grew up like with my parents listening to NPR all the time. <laughs> and so I really loved like audio storytelling 
from when I was an actual kid too. But I started a podcast, a different podcast in 20, beginning of 2018 with a friend of mine, Jonathan Ron. And he and I started what was called the Stoke Cast. And we mm. interviewed outdoor athletes and entrepreneurs and all that. And it was really awesome. It was essentially like an excuse for me to talk to people that I really admired and respected in the outdoor <laughs> community. I've and heard then that a lot. Became... <laughs> yeah, I think you and I can agree on that probably. Yeah. But yeah, it became much more than that. There was a great community around it. And I just felt, wow, this is so what a great medium. And then obviously podcasting just became bigger and bigger. And I just am such a nerd about it. I love it so mm -hmm. much. So I think it's just an incredible time that we live in. Like at, at this point in history, you can listen to the most like interesting, engaging, funny, like educational, anything you name it. There's yep. a podcast out there for you, and you can hear from people that you would literally never know existed ever in the yep. past. So yep. I just feel like it's such a beautiful medium and and one that we're really lucky to have. It's amazing. It's I stumbled into it as well. And my show is more of a, all the years I have in the outdoor space. You go to the show, every trade shows, whether it's the OR show or an adventure show or whatever, and you hear these great conversations and great stories in the aisles of these shows that may never get told again. And my thought was just to somehow capture those stories for posterity and then just get everybody to share them. So there's so many different ways yeah. you can approach it. Yeah, very cool. What's part of podcasting? So you're shifting gears. You're going to, somebody's going to take over the reins of the interview in a, a little bit. What part of podcasting do you enjoy the most? I think I enjoy the, I, I do enjoy the interviews a lot of the time, but I do really enjoy watching these sort of either brain or networking connections happen mm. after interviews are out there. So mm -hmm. when people reach out and say, Oh my gosh, this interview, I felt like this person was telling my story. And thank you so much for putting that out. Like I, those mm -hmm. types of responses are exactly why I wanted to start that in the first place. And I think why a lot of us want to start is, is to serve our community and, mm -hmm. and yeah. put something out there that will help people in one way or another. So I think that is probably my most favorite part now and seeing past guests or active listeners who are really doing, they're reaching out to different people and gaining a better understanding of themselves and others through the, the stories that are being told. So I think for my current podcast, I think that's what I, I love the most. And then more uh, quantitatively, I am a podcast consultant now as well. And so I just love watching like podcasts that I'm working with, like just continue to grow and excel. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I love like playing around with different things and seeing what works and then seeing the growth from there. So I think it's really cool. There's a nerdy side to me where I'm like, yes, give me the numbers. I want to see like what works, what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And then there's the like qualitative of someone saying that an episode inspired them to do X, Y, or Z. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. The connections and the people get connected that you didn't think didn't know each other, but through the shows and stuff, it's pretty fun. That's pretty cool. Yeah. What part of it is the most challenging, do you think? I absolutely hate editing. I will not be ever <laughs> shy about it. I hate it. I hate it. Everyone that knows me Don't is hold like back kind now. of joke. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, I'm just going to go for it. Yeah, um, no, yeah. Yeah, I hate editing audio. I think it's absolutely terrible. It doesn't, my brain doesn't compute. And that's why there's great audio engineers and editors out there. But yeah, that, that part is really arduous to me. And I think for someone who has a, a different brain that or works differently, I think it would be really fun for someone who's like a problem, like right. a mm -hmm. more mathematical problem solver. Mm -hmm. Um it, it ain't for me. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate. Yeah. It can be arduous. It's There's some pretty amazing tools out there now that, that allow you to edit from the uh, script as opposed to the audio. But yeah, it's, it's some of the, I think once you get north of 45 minutes, it's it becomes a task. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. I know. It's, it is so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? So you're a coach and consultant now. What was the motivation for that? Yeah. So I was thinking about leaving my job, my corporate job for a while. And I wanted to do something on my own. I just didn't exactly know uh, what it was going to be. And so I was thinking about writing down like, what are the skills that I have? What are the tangible skills that I have? And then what are the like more ethereal skills that I have that are hard to put a, <laughs> to put a name to? 
And obviously I've been podcasting at that point for three and a half years. I felt like I had a good handle on the different aspects of it. And someone reached out to me and said, Hey, do you do any sort of support or consulting? And that just sparked a whole thinking process of, yes, Mm -hmm. I could definitely do that. And in fact, that's what I want to do. Sometimes Mm -hmm. you just need someone to ask the question and then it starts this whole thing for you. So anyways, I was fortunate enough to to be able to quit my job in June of 2021 and go full time into building a business around podcasting. And it's been really a lot of fun. And I really just, like I said before, I love working with creative people and helping them with their processes and getting growth and playing around with different tactics and stuff like that. It's just a lot of, and there's just so many cool podcasts, especially in the outdoor space, as we know, that I just want to continue to have heard uh, over and over again. And so it just feels like an absolute dream to be able to work with awesome creative people. Yeah, that's the fun part for me is seeing all the different angles and different things that people are thinking of doing with a podcast. It's just amazing. I think it's great. And we have, we're just scratching the surface. It's incredible. So, yeah. So tell listeners how your coaching business works. They just go to your website. What's the, how's that all happen? Yeah, they can go to my website. Essentially, there's four main pillars that I work with folks on. So the first is monthly coaching. And what that looks like is it's very client directed. We meet on a consistent basis and you come to me with your questions, your agenda, the Mm -hmm. things that you need help with. And that is usually for someone who's a little bit earlier on the journey, whether they have a podcast yet or they are just starting their podcast. Usually it's, it's at that stage. So that's one of the first things that I do with folks. And then there's two areas that I help folks with that are more ad hoc and they're just a standalone offering and not a contract basis. One of those things is a brand partnership consultation. So a lot of people want to work with brands and want to get ads on their show so that mm-hmm. they can you know, pay, get paid for the time that they're spending mm-hmm. on their podcasts which makes total sense. But a lot of folks don't exactly know where to start or maybe they have started and they feel like their process is not really getting them where they want them to go and they need some assistance with that. So that's one of them. And then the other one would be doing a full podcast audit. So a podcast audit looks like taking everything into account for a podcaster that's already established. Mm -hmm. So everything in the ecosystem And then delivering essentially an action plan from there, including low-hanging fruit, an actual action plan for different pillars that they have, and then any other considerations that they uh, maybe haven't thought about yet. Hmm. So those are the two ad hoc areas. And then the final one is more of custom partnerships, custom clients who they tell me their needs, they tell me what they want to be taken off their plate or what they need consulting on or strategy around. And then we work on that together. That are, Those are the different ways that I work with clients. That sounds pretty comprehensive. You cover it soup to nuts. That's, <laughs> no, that's awesome. That's great. And I do have some folks that come to me and say, they think I do audio, audio editing. And as we've <laughs> talked about, I definitely don't. <laughs> so I also have some good contacts for people too. So if people need help with audio editing, I have a couple right. of folks that I know and trust that I, I know can help them out. Yeah, there's a lot of resources for that, yeah. I may have to hit you up for one of those consultations. Right. Hey, you know what? We could always use help. I think it's, especially for someone like me who's been in the industry for so long, some of the things that I embark on have changed over the years. And mm. it's because I haven't done it for so long, I don't realize that. So it's always yeah, it's always good to get a coach on some things you need help with. Yep. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I do the coaching too, so it's, hey, whatever you guys need help with. We're going to take a little break and give some love to our sponsor, Thrive Market. Think organic groceries are too expensive? So does Thrive Market. They guarantee savings on healthy groceries and home essentials delivered. How? It's easy. They work directly with the best organic brands so you get the highest quality products without the big retail markups. Shop everything from pantry essentials to sustainable meat and seafood to toxic cleaning supplies and save up to 30% on your favorites. Choose a free gift up to $24 in value when you purchase a Thrive Market membership. One- and two-year memberships are available. Go to ricksays.com slash thrivemarket and get your membership today. That's ricksays.com slash thrivemarket. Now, back to the show. Without giving in giving away any state secrets, any future projects coming up that you can talk about? Yeah, I am 
working on, it, it's already out there right now, but with the beginning stages, myself and my colleagues, Chris Hansen and Devin Dabney, they co-founded a, a podcast network called Plug Tone Audio. Hmm. And this is a going to be a place where outdoor podcasters are housed. So under this collective where podcasters can come together and really get a supportive community around them for their own shows. And then eventually we will be working with brands as well to help them with their you know, marketing needs and potentially custom content. So I'm really excited about that. I think there's some really cool things that can be done that, frankly, outdoor brands seem to be either hesitant or just don't really know where to start with yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So I think we can be a, a resource for those folks. So it's not necessarily state secret. It's just still at the <laughs> beginning stages. Still uh, early. Yeah, no, that's good. That's a good one. Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity for outdoor brands. I've talked about it with a number of people on my show and other shows. And it just, I was talking to somebody this morning, the podcast lines right up to the outdoor community because we can't always watch their video. We can't sit down and watch YouTube or watch whatever, but we can always stick an earbud in our ear, whether we're paddling, hiking, climbing, and listen to a podcast, as I'm sure you do, right. I do. So it's perfect. No, yeah. exactly. I think it's just like the perfect medium for the outdoor community. And I mm -hmm. also think there's a real, like people want to see and hear real stories coming from brands and yep. not just yep. like elite athleticism feats, which are cool, but they're not really like what people get inspired by to go do their version of that thing. So yep. I do think there's more, there's more opportunity for brands to do custom storytelling through branded podcasts than they are right now. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think brands and retailers and small brands that are just starting out, you can really expand your reach because everybody's selling online right now. So if you're selling your products online or your services online, a podcast will allow you to, I think my show is played in over 47 countries or something. So you can get all around the world. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. So let's shift gears. You get outside a lot. What are your outdoor activities of choice? Climbing, I heard. Yeah. So I would say that climbing, skiing, and hiking and trail running would probably be my main activities. Mm -hmm. I, I obviously camp a lot. So that's an outdoor activity. I backpack a <laughs> little bit here You got to camp to do some there. of those other things, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You got to just live in a tent for a lot of that stuff. Yeah, we do a lot of that. And I also, I do have a stand-up paddleboard. So this next summer, I really want to like make that more of like a weekly engagement <laughs> instead mm -hmm. of like once every three months I do it. Yeah, just it's really calm nice activity to do. And mm -hmm. so I want to get a little bit more into that this year. That sounds like a good goal. Do you have any suggestions or advice for folks that want to get into the outdoor biz, adventure biz? Yeah. Similar to what I said about podcasting, I think we live in this really interesting and weird time in which <laughs> you can create a, a name for yourself, regardless of where you want to put yourself, what industry. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the thing that I think is most helpful is just start being consistent w w with whatever practice you want to. So if you want to be a writer, then you should write on most days, like creating those habits to start building that level of content or, or what you're trying to do. If you want to be a guide, then start getting those certifications, start, you know, volunteering for different organizations that might need some extra help, things like that. I think there's always ways that you can start even before you feel like mentally ready or financially ready to go into a new industry and try to start a new career. But I think like you can produce a lot of stuff on your own. So if, if you want to be a creative or a content creator, then that you already have everything you need. You just need to start actually doing it consistently. Yeah, that's good um, advice. It is amazing how much content someone can create in a day or a week. It's phenomenal. Yeah, it's yeah. And there's, it, yeah. There's, there's awesome resources out there for like how to create content mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. more effectively. And, and there's some great content sprints that I go to every mm -hmm. couple of weeks. Yeah, there's great resources out there. It's just a matter of finding them. And also say like the outdoor space is it's so big but it's so small mm -hmm, so if mm -hmm. you're interested in someone's job like you see someone's job and it seems really cool just reach out to them and see hey can i ask you a couple questions like maybe buy them a virtual coffee send them like a five dollar starbucks gift card or something and mm -hmm. say hey i want to just ask you a couple questions about your career trajectory and see if you have any recommendations based off of my past experiences and stuff and then really come to those conversations prepared um, mm -hmm. and ready mm -hmm. to ask 
Good question. And then always at the end, I would say, if you're asking someone for their time to essentially, quote unquote, pick their brain, at the end, you should absolutely always ask what they need, what they're needing more of right now, what support you could give in your current state for them, those mm-hmm. types of mm-hmm. things. Yeah, no, that's good advice. That's I love the go into it with some thought and then ask how you can help. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. The worst thing ever is to get a message of someone saying like, hey, can I ask you about <laughs> podcasting? Yeah. Technically, yes, but I don't know what you're asking. You've got to be more specific than that right, to, right. For, to get a response from most people. So how about some advice about podcasting? What would be your advice to someone who wants to start a podcast from scratch? Yeah. I would say if you want to start a podcast, first and foremost, you should ask yourself, why do you want to start a podcast? Mm-hmm. Is it that you feel like there's a real gap and there's a really cool concept that you're coming up with and you think it would be really great for this specific community or audience? Is it that you you know, have your own business and you want to get in front of people a little bit more, bring them value, but also potentially like funnel them to your own business? Is it that you want to get more brand awareness for your brand and therefore you want to be involved in some storytelling? Just really asking, keep going on those levels of why. Okay, if I want to start it to serve this community, why? Okay, is it because I want more notoriety or is it because Mm -hmm. I really feel like this will be helpful for the community? So those are really important to ask yourself Um, and think about the impact it will have as well. What do you hope that people actually walk away from your podcast with? These Mm -hmm. questions are all should be asked before you even name your podcast, (laughs) conceptualize your podcast, Mm -hmm. uh, reach out to an audio editor. Starting with intentionality and purpose is the best thing to do. And then once you have some of those answers to those questions, really think about, okay, if I move forward with this podcast, how am I going to measure my success? Because podcast metrics are absolute BS, to be honest. (laughs) And they're sure hard to get. That's for sure. (laughs) They're hard to get. They're BS and they're like arbitrary because you know nothing about anyone else around you, who's doing what, who has what, listenership. You have no idea who to compare yourself to. And mm-hmm. you definitely shouldn't compare yourself to the big ends of the Gimlet media or right. like armchair expert. Right. So I think having some metrics that you really can come back to that are achievable and specific. So having those quantifiable metrics, but then like we were talking about before, having a qualitative side too, where you're like, I will feel like this is a success if I have one person send me a note and say, I really learned a lot in this Mm. episode Mm -hmm. and it made me do X, Y. Yeah. I just say that because I think when the going gets tough and you're in your seventh hour of editing a stupid episode, (laughs) 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 no, I'm just like, you can tell I hate editing, but when you're going gets tough, And you're in that, like, why am I doing this headspace? You need to be able to come back to something that's greater than just I'm doing it because and I want to be successful. And success means that I get 600 episode listens per episode. Like Mm -hmm. That's going to mean nothing to you. Mm -hmm. If you can say, why am I doing this? I'm doing it because it serves my community. And look at this message that I got last week on my last episode that Mm -hmm. said it Mm -hmm. like changed this person's life. Those are the things that you really need to think about before you start any of the thinking about what mic you need or what distribution platform you should Mm -hmm. go after. Mm -hmm. No, that's good advice. And I think the other thing too is even if you do get to the point, I tell everybody, if you're going to do it, try to do it as inexpensively as you can. Use whatever gear you have. Don't spend a bunch of gear because you might do, you might get into it and have all these great reasons, but then you do four episodes and you go, I hate this. And if you're going to, feel bad, worse, and want to continue if you spend a bunch of money. Don't spend a bunch of money. Just try test drive it. Yeah, yeah. So Yeah, yeah I that, think that's really smart. It's well, just, I ripped that off from Tim Ferriss, too. He's smarter than I am. Oh, so. yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's smarter than most people. But <laughs> yes. he, I think also there's so many tools, too, that you can get free trials on. Like right. we were talking about that uh, transcription service um, mm-hmm. called Descript that you could use. There's a free version of that. There's some free trials for like email marketing stuff that you could use. There's free trials for your editing software. So there's all these free resources that you can utilize Mm -hmm. and you can even see a lot of them have 30 day trials. So you can see within that month. And you can really do it with your phone and zoom. You don't need a mic and you just use your earbuds and it'll be fine for the first couple episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. 
How about, so what's your favorite outdoor gear purchase under a hundred dollars? Yes, I have a tiny little shovel that mm. is <laughs> intended to shovel when you have to go to the bathroom in the outdoors it, because yeah. you should be <laughs> digging a hole and then covering it because leave no trace. So that thing is like not even an ounce. I think it's so light. It's so cool. It's like one of those things in REI that's like at the end of the checkout and you're like, yeah, I need this little tiny shovel. So that is definitely one of my favorites. But I would also say my headlamp is probably my second favorite. It's like the most useful and I use it obviously all the time when I'm camping or even like hiking, backpacking, whatever. So right. I think those, those, I gave two answers. That's good. That? Yeah. You're uh, ahead of the class. <laughs> Most people <Yeah>. struggle <laughs> with one. It's the hardest question I ask, I think. How about uh, your favorite outdoor, uh, sorry, your favorite podcast gear, piece of equipment? Oh, Do you have one of those? Favorite podcast piece of equipment? Not necessarily I mean, under $100 because those are all a little more expensive. But I don't think I have a favorite. I think <laughs> probably, I think I probably a piece of software the best. I use Adobe Audition to edit my yep. um, podcast. And I think out of the ones that I played around with when I started doing Nature Untold, it was like still a professional grade editing software, but it also is not so hard to understand right. that like a little like editing dummy like me can't figure out. I think that's probably my favorite. And then I've used Anchor FM for my hosting and distribution platform for mm. ever. Mm. And I, it's a free service and I think it's, it does a good job and it's owned by Spotify. So there's only cool. like greater things to come. Yeah. That, yeah. So. Good. Yeah. Spotify is, um, Racking it up these days, that's for sure. <laughs> they really are. <laughs> Getting yeah. a lot of publicity for one reason or another, so I guess that's good. Right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. How about a couple of your favorite books? Are you a reader? Do you have any favorite books? Oh, yeah. I am a, I would say, pretty voracious reader. Um, actually, I'm reading a book right now that I think will be so good for most people. A lot of people have already read it, probably. It's been out for a few years. It's called Atomic Habits, and... I like, I'm only 20% in, I would say, and I'm already thinking about all of my habitual behaviors and how I can improve them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so cool. really, it, it goes through like how to create really incremental progress using smaller habits mm -hmm. that are easier to do. That's really good. My favorite, one of my favorite like outdoor based books is by Brendan Leonard. It's called 60 Meters to Anywhere. Brendan is an awesome writer. I will read anything he writes. I buy every book he publishes. Oh, wow. He is the creator of semirad.com, which is a, a blog that's been going for I think like 11 or 12 years now. But his book, 60 Meters to Anywhere, is I think 10 years old at this point, but it essentially goes through how he went into recovery early in his 20s and then found rock climbing and all these sort of life lessons that he goes through and trying to be a writer in the outdoor world and relationship stuff. So it's just really well done and an easy read, but really uh, cool, thoughtful and, and insightful. Yeah, yeah, I haven't heard about that one. I've listened, I listened to Atomic Habits on Audible. Oh, and, cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was really good. Yeah, it's funny. He, that's, I've been a habitual guy and list guy and workflow guy since I was a kid. It's ingrained in me. I don't know where it comes from, but he, I really love, as you said, some of the things he, about starting. Don't start with the big picture. Just do this little change and then incrementally yeah. it explodes. So that was, that's a really good one. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Once we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to ask or say of our listeners? No, I would just say that if, if anyone, <laughs> If you want to pick my brain, quote unquote, about <laughs> podcasting, feel free to reach out. And I'm always happy to chat a little bit here and there and see if there's anything I can help with, of course. Um, and I would also just say that although a lot of people seem to think that podcasting is already saturated, it is not. And mm -hmm. there is still room for you and your voice and your show in the space. So it's still in the infancy stages, even though it might not feel like that right now. So don't be scared to, to add your voice to the mix. And in fact, the more voices, the better. Totally agree. 100%. That's good. And if people want to follow up with you, how's the best way to do that? Yeah. My Instagram, my professional Instagram is podcast nerdery. Yeah, that's mm, right. Podcast cool. nerdery. And then my personal email is Emily. I'm sorry. Yeah. Emily at emilyholland.c and you can hit me up there. Awesome. We'll link to all that in the show notes. Thanks for the time, Emily. This has been great. Thanks so much, Rick. 
Thank you for joining us on another episode of the Outdoor Biz Podcast. Be sure to visit our website, theoutdoorbizpodcast.com, where you'll find show notes with links to everything we talked about and more. Subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or spread the word and tell a friend about the show. That would really help us out, too. Be sure to tune in every week. And thanks again for listening to the Outdoor Biz Podcast with Rick Sayez. Thank you.